This is Frank Collada, and you are listening to Gangland Wire. And if you're ever in Vegas, take the Frank Collada Casino Tour, 702-622-0850. Thank you. Soldado, or Soldia, Cantiglieri, Capo di Tutto Capi. You have um, Soto Capo is your underboss. I just called him the boss. This is Gunnar Allen Limblu. Check out my book, To Be a King, at tobeakingnovel.com. You're listening to Gangland Wire. Former Kansas City Police Department intelligence detective and now attorney Gary Jenkins produced four documentary films, most recently Gangland Wire creator of smartphone app entitled Kansas City Mob Tours. Download it now. If you like what you hear, go to ganglandwire.com. Navigate to the shop page. We need you to put a hit out on our donate button. Gangland Wire True Crime Stories is produced at the Big Dumb Fun Show Studio 4. And now, here's Gary Jenkins. Well, good evening, all you wiretappers out there. It's uh, good to be here in the Big Dumb Fun Show studio. The beautiful Ice House building in Midtown Kansas City. I'm not getting my thoughts straight. I'm going to have to (laughs) smooth myself out. Uh, It's kind of cold outside, and we are actually doing this in the early morning hours. Uh, I'll let you know why in a minute. Uh, Say hello to the folks out there, Aaron. Hello, Aaron. Tonight, we have a very, very special guest coming to you all the way via Skype from Europe. I'd like for you to welcome the uh, a fellow mob investigator and documenter and uh, uh, all-around raconteur, David Amoroso. Say hello, David. Hello. Thanks for having me, uh, Gary. Well, it's it's good to have you here, folks, and and uh, I, I want you to know, and I want you all to go check out his mafia, organized crime, all kinds of organized crime, not just the La Cosa Nostra mafia, which you know that that we kind of focus on here, but other kinds of organized crime, biker gangs, European, Russian mafia, and and all kinds of organized crime at www. g a n g s t e r s i n c. dot org. Uh, David, uh, uh, I'm going to let you do it. Uh, David, tell us a little bit about your blog site, your website. Uh, it's, uh, I founded it in uh, 2001. I became interested in, in the mafia and organized crime from watching The Sopranos, actually, because uh, I was watching the, 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 if you were the fiction of the side of it, and I was like, what, what's the true story behind this uh, fictional television show? Because I knew it was based on some uh, real characters, and I, I decided to read up on them, and that's how my, uh, well, basically how my investigative side was um, aroused, if you will, and I became a mob buff, and I became reading everything I could about the mafia, and uh, I, I always have loved writing. I'm a journalist myself. I got a bachelor's degree in journalism, and I decided to, why not just set up a website? Back then, in 2001, there wasn't a lot of uh, there weren't a lot of websites dedicated to the mafia or organized crime. You had AmericanMafia.com and you had Jerry Capeschi's uh, website, but that was pretty much it. So I decided, like, you know, I'm going to focus on, as you said, the, the global organized crime scene, uh, the Russian mafia, the, the Japanese Yakuza, the Chinese triad, everything and anything. And, uh, well, basically I've been going strong now for uh, 16 years. So, yeah, it's, it's been uh, awesome. Oh, that's great. You know, David, and, and I appreciate what you've done because I've gone to you several times to research. Matter of fact, when I first uh, created my own website, started looking into this, and, and I, I mainly have focused on, started off with Kansas City, uh, La Cosa Nostra Mafia families, and or the, the Mafia family here in Kansas City, and then started branching out while well, I was able to learn a lot from your website. So I, I uh, of course, subscribe to it and and uh, uh, take a look at it every once in a while, sometimes just for my own enjoyment. And and that website, I want to repeat this one more time, folks. I want you to go to it and check it out. It's www.gangstersinc.org. Remember that. It's not .com. It's .org. Yeah, if you're listening to this right now, you could actually 
just surf on over there if you're not right, driving right. your car, right. if you're home and your computer, and check it out. Uh, you have a uh, subscription as well. Like uh, You can subscribe to Gangland Wire and get on our mail list. Uh, they have one as well for uh, Gangsters, Inc. Yeah, you can go to Facebook, Twitter. And so uh, your your Facebook, uh, that's uh, Gangsters, Inc. I'm, I'm on it too, but I can't remember all of a sudden. Yeah, it's it's uh, Facebook, and then you put the, uh, the dot com and uh, slash, and it's uh, Gangsters Inc. Just that's now, it. Now, in two thousand one, there. I mean, other than say, like you know, there was the Sopranos. I guess what other kind of material? There wasn't a lot of other stuff out there, was there? The popularity has certainly grown since uh, since you started in two thousand and one. Yeah, definitely. I think uh, back then you had the Sopranos, and before that, obviously you had Goodfellas and Casino and. You know, all the, the big mob movies, Godfather. But as far as uh, The Sopranos was just, it was a weekly show, so it came back every week. And it was uh, sort of like year after year it came back. I just think that, you know, back then uh, people be, sort of became more interested. I think they were happy with the, the movies that we had at the time. And now it's like, you know, with the internet, people want new movies, new television series, uh, new podcasts, new websites, new articles. It's nonstop. So I think that's really... The biggest difference between now and, and back then, back then it was just, you know, just tiny bits of websites, uh, articles. There wasn't really that a lot going on. And then after that, it just, it boomed. And now you have several websites, you have podcasts dedicated to organized crime. Uh, there's television, I think there's hardly any television show right now that's not, that hasn't gotten like a, a mob boss character. You know, if you look at uh, Luke Cage, Marvel's, uh, New television series on Netflix or any other show, they all have mob bosses or some kind of reference to Japanese Yakuza or the Chinese triads or the Russian mobsters or Albanian mobsters. So I think, yeah, it, it definitely has, you know, boomed since then. Yeah, that's for sure. I've, I've noticed with, uh, as I, I started this in 2013 when I did the, my film, uh, Gangland Wire. And that was really the back backstory behind the movie Casino, and, and the Kansas yeah. City into that investigation. Why, from just from then until today, I would say the mob interest and the mob Facebook pages and and all that have probably, I don't know, quadrupled. There there must be. I think there's three or four in Chicago alone that primarily focus on the Chicago outfit. It, it's just been amazing. Yeah. And then you have the reality shows. I mean. The Mob Wives, and, you know, uh, I think you have uh, the Bonanno uh, family, uh, Mitch, who now has his own show as well. I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's the latest one. So I think, you know, we had Growing Up Gotti. It's, it's amazing that these, you know, people who used to operate in the shadows, they, they basically are coming out into the open. Oh, uh, right. Now they're becoming personalities <laughs> for reality <laughs> exactly. shows. Exactly. Well, you know, really think about it. Uh, they used to be if you turned around and ratted somebody out and testified against them, you just disappeared for the rest of your life or your life was in danger. Now we've got our friend Frank Culotte out there in Las Vegas running a Las Vegas mob tour for anybody that wants yeah. to come and pay him to drive him around Las Vegas. And he's got about four books out there. The interesting thing about when you take that ride with Frank Culotta, he always wants to sit in the back seat. <laughs> and he wants you to start the car. <laughs> <laughs> Kidding. We don't know that Kidding, for sure. Yeah. That's, like the, that's like the old joke that I've told before. My wife doesn't really like it. I, I'll give a program. And, of course, I used to investigate the mob in Kansas City. And I'll say, you know, my wife, she was really happy when I uh, uh, retired and, and quit investigating the mob. And then I'll just let a little pause out there, and people are going, well, you know, well, how come? You know, they're waiting for me to say, and I said, well, now she didn't have to go out and start the car every morning when I go to work. <laughs> she does not like that joke at no, all. No, <laughs> she, she doesn't like him doing this podcast either. <laughs> no, it makes her ner it makes her nervous. You don't you puts don't. me back into it. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, you're lucky, aren't you? I mean, the, the mafia in the U.S. isn't anywhere near as uh, dangerous as they used to be. Oh, right. no. Oh, no. Oh, no. There are just a couple of guys around here that make me a little bit nervous, and I know they they, they know that I exist. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of hard to do a podcast or a blog in the shadows <laughs> and uh, remain anonymous. I know we uh, were one time doing a, some uh, material about the Ku Klux Klan and some white supremacists that Gary had a great story uh, from when he was on the police force as a sergeant running a tactical squad that broke up a, 
a, a, a clan meeting, so to speak, but it was more at a public access TV station. And uh, he was uh, concerned about getting photos out and uh, having our faces out there where people could actually see it because of that. And it doesn't make a lot, didn't make a lot of sense to me because then the next episode we're talking about Frank Culotta and Vegas and, and how we're here at the Ice House. Yeah. So, I mean, if they want me, I guess they, they'll it, find me. There's it, so many pictures of me out there now and so many ways to find me. It's unbelievable. Yeah, he did get a scary guy at the uh, in Las Vegas sitting there during his presentation, <laughs> I he did. said. I did have one. Oh, well. Now, what about you, though, David? You, I mean, since 2001, you've really been uh, putting it up uh, online for people to find, read, share, and... Um, do you ever find yourself looking over your shoulder? Well, I mean, I, I never put my photo on there. So I think that, that sort of like gave me some extra uh, sense of safety, if you will. Um, the, the biggest problems I've had actually was just with lawyers who wanted stuff removed from the website because their client didn't like being on there. Um, several times I've had like a message from Google that they said, you know, that they removed me from certain search results to certain pages. So that's pretty much the only, the biggest problem that I've had. I've had some threats via email, but I think everyone has those. You know, people, uh, there's some fanboys out there who don't like when you write about certain guys or you're, you're critical of certain people. So they come up and they, uh, especially on Facebook, actually, they, they come up and they, they threaten you. But it's just typical stuff, you know, you, you rat cucks, you know, bleep, bleep. You know, I don't know if I can curse on here, but... It's, it's that kind of stuff, you know, and, and that's really, it, it doesn't come across as that threatening. It's more like, uh, oh, here's another fanboy who's doing that stuff. And I've, I've actually met some uh, real criminals uh, and, and gang bosses in, in Europe here. Mm-hmm. And, um, and they, you know, usually that they don't really care about uh, what's being written as long as it's, well, as long as it's correct and as long as it's not exposing any of their current day-to-day operations. I mean, they're, they're very strict about that, of course. But I think as long as you behave in a certain way that it's, um, they know they can't bullshit with you, then they won't pull anything. I think once you start becoming their friend or once you start becoming a tool for them and you uh, double cross them or you, uh, you know, you do something that hurts their business, they treat you as a friend who ratted them out. And that's a problem. But if you, if, if you treat them as sources and if you treat them as, you know, people that know that you're a journalist, I, you know, I tend to say that they, you tend to, you know, behave in a normal way, if you will. I mean, you always have to be cautionary, but, you know, in, in general, I feel like uh, I've, I've had a lucky run with these guys. Well, certainly since 2001 to here now in 2017, yeah. the, the, uh, it, what, what comes to mind is uh, uh, an incident that happened here in Kansas City with myself. I was working at uh, my other part-time job, Chubby's on Broadway, one morning, and uh, that was a business that was owned by a local family, the Labruzos. And uh, Uncle Frank is a nephew to Tuffy DeLuna. Who's the underboss of the Kansas City family. Yeah. And uh, had ridden up on the elevator with him in the federal building years ago when he was being taken to court. And Frank's a great guy. And uh, he runs a lunch truck. And uh, there was a story that uh, Gary had mentioned a star rep- Kansas City star reporter had come along and said, Hey... I'm doing some research. Can I talk with you? And and Gary mentioned it in passing like he may when we'd meet, and I didn't really think much of it. And then this story came out at 6 in the morning. There's Frank sitting at the lunch counter reading the paper, and there's a story about one of his uncles who he thought committed suicide, they told him, when he was five years old. And there was another officer who was a detective, like a plainclothes detective, Richard, who was also reading the story right there at the lunch counter. Oddly enough, he comes in every morning as well. And uh, he spun the paper around and pointed Gary's name out. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and Uncle Frank was kind of, you could see that he was, you know, this upset him. And uh, he kind of looked to me as if I was somebody who had some kind of inside information, that I had some knowledge at forehand of something like this. And... Mm-hmm. um I don't know if anybody ever does that with you, where these guys think you have inside sources, so you have information maybe. Uh, but, you know, in those kind of moments, I don't know what you do, but I know what I do. And I tell Uncle Frank that if I'd known anything, I certainly would have told him in advance. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> You'd rat me out, huh? Yeah, I would have said, hey, there's this article <laughs> coming out in the paper. Well, they, I think the part of it is because they look at me like because I do this podcast that I'm kind of I am this inside source. And so yeah. I should know this stuff because we do this podcast. And quite frankly, most of the time, Gary comes into the studio and hands me, uh, you know, four or five or six or eight or ten pages of paper and we go at it. So my yeah. my lead time isn't always as, as much as I'd like it to be. But you ever find that that happens yeah. where people expect you to have some kind of inside knowledge because you've been doing this yeah. for so long? Yeah, yeah, that does happen. You know, not not a lot. I think because I'm so global. I think people, uh, the people that I do meet, um, you know, there's there's other reporters doing stuff on the local scene, like you know Gary and you at Kansas City. Uh, you know, I might write about Kansas City once in a while, but people will not look at me like I'm the insider in, on on Kansas City. And I think that goes for a lot of the other stories as well. I think there's, you know, if I write something about uh, Chinese organized crime, there's going to be people out there who know more about that than I do. And it, it, it did happen, though, when I met uh, one uh, British uh, drug boss. I met him, and uh, he was ta- telling a story about um, going to this charity event, and he had, um, he had a, a nice, he wanted a nice suit, and he was looking in his closet, and he, uh, he pulled out one of his uh, jackets, and he said, you know, there was um, 20,000 pounds in there, which is a lot of money. And he said he had forgotten all about that. And I was like... I re, you know, my reaction was the reaction of any poor journalist who's not making any money. Like, yeah, right. You know that, that you can't be serious about that. And I remember his face that switched because he was being serious, and I didn't believe him. And this was just a, a regular story, but he just uh, kind of flipped out on me because I didn't believe him. It, it wasn't scary per se, but I was worried about you know losing a source or losing someone who might. Uh, share some information with me or would explain certain stuff to me. But um, it was just a simple misunderstanding, really, and, and me not believing him created this tension that was, uh, it was interesting at that time, and, and luckily everything went okay. But uh, that was one instance where this had nothing to do with me sharing inside information or being asked to, but it was a situation where I was like, oh, damn, this, this might end up causing me some trouble down the road and luckily it didn't but that was one of the instances where I felt like uh, a bit threatened and a bit over some you know minor thing really because just because I didn't believe his story you know and then actually he he kept on going with it because he later uh, actually sent me some photos of cash uh, uh, piles of cash that he had at his house like uh, later that night so it, it was all in good fun later on but it, it really I guess hurt his feelings, if you will. So that mm-hmm. was that was just a weird situation to be in. David, you you and Aaron both just experienced what I call the the dual personality of these professional criminals. On, on one yeah. hand, they are charming, and you know, it always you get more uh, attract more flies with honey than you do with vinegar. But when you quit attracting flies with the honey, then sometimes you got to go to the vinegar, and they'll, it's like an act that they know how to go into in order to dominate and manipulate people. They can go from being your buddy and, and acting like you're, you're the greatest thing in the world to that death stare and that uh, maybe almost like a fake kind of a, uh, put upon anger that, that then they need to get you under your control has been my experience with these professional criminals. Yeah. Now. I, and I don't know that Frank is a professional criminal. I don't think he is at all. And uh, not in my experience with him. Yeah, if that, I definitely told Gary that story later on. And I said, hey, if you happen to talk to another reporter and you think there's going to be a story come out, let me know. And I would let them know <laughs> in advance because in some ways I think that perception that we have this inside information is a... Uh, uh, is is worth propagating <laughs> <laughs> that's true that's true well you know, you know I, because you got to come for the source <laughs> if you're going to get material that people want to hi- find right they they're not going to go and go to your site because they can find it everywhere else <laughs> that's true all right enough of all that let's let's get into what we kind of came here to talk about and and the gray brothers well no <laughs> two two things you know we're we're i'll tell you david and i know you're not like an expert on the cray brothers but I've always been interested in the Cray brothers personally, uh, who folks, yeah. have, a lot of most Americans don't know uh, anything about the Cray brothers unless you're a real 
organized crime professional criminal uh, aficionado, shall we say? But uh, uh, Ronald, was it Ronald and Reginald Cray uh, in uh, England, and they seemed to dominate all the London-based rackets, and and they were particularly interesting. I thought one one of them was gay, I believe. Uh, which in yeah. in that world <laughs> in the United States, that uh, homie don't play that as we used to say. You saw what happened to the gay dude in uh, the Sopranos, and and that would be pretty much uh, 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 you know across the board in the United States in those crime families. But can, what what can you tell our listeners about the famous Cray brothers? Well, we were just talking about the 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 two sides of of these gangsters, and I think that the Cray the Cray twins they they had this down to a T because they ran several clubs in London. You know, they bought up nightclubs and bars and stuff like that, and then they start running a protection racket. So they would just uh, extort money from all the clubs' owners in the street. But because they owned these nightclubs, the, the, the superstars, the football players, and the, the movie stars and television stars, they would come in to party, and uh, the newspaper people would take pictures of all these stars coming to their clubs. And Naturally, the Cray twins would be on those photos as well and became sort of like a celebrity uh, gangster twin couple, if you will. And, you know, with these celebrities, they would be, you know, very charming and they would be funny and, you know, they would all have a jolly old time. But these guys were ultra violent and some would say a bit crazy. And they weren't as organized as the mafia back in uh, America or in Italy, but they did, you know, because of their reputation they just ran these criminal records in uh london so that was pretty much their game and they were an interesting couple really because you know as brothers it doesn't happen too often that you have two brothers at the helm of an uh an organized crime group but they were one of many in london actually but because of their high profile they became um at least in terms of media uh exposure they became top dogs and uh, it, it's actually what brought them down in the end. But these guys were charming and everything, and then they would go out and slap some people around and extort some money and maybe do a hijacking or a, a robbery. And that's how they made their money, and, and they could invest that in, in the club scene. So that, that was really how they made their money and how they uh, got their reputation. So so they had like a like an organization, uh, you know, like maybe... Uh, some uh, capos, where we love some underbosses that that would have a crew who would go out and take care of loan shark collections or extortions or another crew that would maybe go do some hijackings and and then they would set them up with fencing opportunities that that kind of a thing kind of your normal organized crime family that we know in the United States. No, no, nothing like that. No, they were just a, a crew of. Uh, well, I mean, it depends on who you talk to. I think you know. I've read several books about the craves and. You know, some would describe them as being pretty organized, and others would say that they were just a ragtag group of guys sitting around in a bar looking for the biggest opportunity to make money. And I think the truth is somewhere in between. I think especially if you look at their, their rise, I think that in the beginning they were just, you know, sitting around looking for opportunities. And as they, their power grew and their influence grew, they probably had guys, you know, doing the extortion runs for them to pick up the money and maybe organize the robbery and they got a taste of it. But it was never as organized as organized crime in the U.S. or uh, Sicily or you know anywhere else because it was just those two guys and they had some people that they trusted with some business. But mostly they were very hands-on because that's you know in Europe there's different rules and there's different ways of um, organizing I guess and I think that in um, they, I would I would compare them more to the Westies in uh, Hell's Kitchen in New York where you have two guys on top with a bunch of guys underneath, and, and pretty much everyone is doing their job and their part. But the, the, the Cray Twins are just, I guess, running a small crew. That would be more more, more precise, actually. Okay, thanks. That, that, that makes a lot of sense to me. They, they actually became so famous because of what you initially said. They got all that press attention. That's why everybody knows who the Cray Brothers are. Exactly. They, they know because of the nightclubs. They, they controlled the nightclubs there, and they bought, you know, they invested their, you know, ill-gotten gains in there. And uh, that's how they got an in with all these celebrities. And because of their charming side, they were able to, uh, you know, continue that relationship. And, and as time grew and as they grew more power-hungry, if you will, 
things started escalating and there would be more fights and more violence. And a lot of these celebrities would realize what was going on and it would eventually, you know, there would be a break between these people. But by then, you know, the newspapers would be filled with their photos. And I think because they're high profile, I think police as well as the media would label them as the kings of organized crime simply because they were the ones most visible. I think if you look at um, some of the other guys out there, you had the Richardson brothers who were also in London. Uh, I don't know too much about them, but I do know that there were several other crews uh, in, in London that were operating at the time at a, a much more sophisticated level at the time. And, um, you know, they got away with it. And, and, and afterwards, years later, decades later, you had the, uh, the Adams family, which is a very funny name when you think about the TV show, but it, it was actually a... a uh, again, these were brothers. They formed the crew and they dominated uh, organized crime in London. And they actually were into uh, drug dealing, robberies, hijackings, contract killings, the whole lot. And they, these guys were a lot more professional than than the uh, than the Cray twins. But because they were no, they were so low key and people didn't know them, they sort of like skated under the radar. And I think that's really the difference between the Cray twins and any other criminal or gangster or gang boss in uh, London from that time on. And if you look at uh, organized crime in the United Kingdom, each story, it doesn't matter if it's in Scotland or it's in Ireland, they all have this, this kind of historic story about their own local crime boss standing up to the Quay train, like uh, meeting one of them or being uh, subject to a uh, possible robbery and then turning it on them. And, and it's, it's sort of like to bolster their own reputation. So some of these guys might have actually started to, to gossip themselves, and other people might have just started gossiping to, you know, enhance the, the reputation of their local crime boss. But that is actually the power of these these cray twins, where no one really thought they were as powerful as they they were, but because of the press coverage, everyone just fell for it. And you know, the American mafia in the beginning, they actually paid respect to the cray twins as well. Because they felt like, you know, these guys, they have the reputation. They own these nightclubs in London, and we want to run a casino here, so pay our respect. But pretty soon, once they started running the casinos, they, they realized that these guys were pretty much loose cannons. And they weren't as, as sophisticated as they might have seen. You know, like you said, you know, if, if they ran organized crime in London, you would expect them to have, you know, divisions and capos and, and underboss and people who, who ran shit, and they would be professional, but they were far from it. I actually have one story where uh, you had, well, actually, this, this is a, a story about the American mafia uh, running casinos in, in London, but so they were set up there, and you had, um, let me think, what, which uh, Cray Twin it was, but um, they were running a casino in London, expensive, it's, it's a luxurious uh, place, and you had George Raft, uh, the former actor who played several gangsters in, in the gangster movie back in the day. And this was in the 1960s, by the way. And he ran the casino. He was sort of like a front guy for the American mafia. At one point, uh, Ronnie Cray walked in. And he was starting an argue, argument pretty fast with, these, uh, with his father and son couple who were at the casino. You know, he was going to, like, uh, you know, beat them up. And, uh, you know, he was very aggressive. And uh, at one point... George Raff pulls one of uh, Cray's uh, associates aside and he says, has Ronnie met the blade yet? And the, the essence of that sentence was that uh, Raff was asking if he should put out or put this uh, Genovese crime family mobster on Ronnie Cray. The blade was a nickname for Charles Turin, who was uh, part of the Genovese crime family and who oversaw that casino. He was there to protect their interests. And uh, he was going to sort Ronnie Cray out because uh, at that point, George Raft had no clue how they would, should handle this kind of situation. So in the end, it was all resolved and nothing went wrong. But it sort of like indicates that, you know, despite what people may think of the Crays, they might not have been as, pop, as, as powerful as they seemed at the time. You know, and even uh, back then, at the height of their power, people would still see them as uh, loose cannons and they would, if, if they continued their drunken behavior, their aggressive behavior, they might have been taken out by an American uh, gangster overseas. Yeah, they prob probably would have. Um, 
I uh, that fits that 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 is totally logical with things I've seen here in in the United States. Uh, for example, if if a uh, mob boss here in Kansas City wants to uh, extort some money from a club or start moving in on a club, he'll send two or three young guys who are associates and send a man, and they'll just start fights. And then the mob guy can send another guy around and say, you know, hey, we can stop these fights, but. You know, you you got to take care of us, but we'll, we'll stop all these problems. And, and that's probably what the Cray brothers started to do, the Cray twins started to do with uh, that particular yeah. casino. They just bit off, they went into the wrong casino, and, and it sounded like they backed down pretty quick when, when Raph dropped the name of the Blade and they understood who the Blade was. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the, the mob started working with them a, a little bit, but it was sort of like they, they paid them a little bit just to keep quiet. But, you know, the mob at that point was so powerful, and they still had all these, all this talent, if you will, from, like, back in the day. These were the, you know, the, the mafia was in its prime at that time, and they had so many killers walking around and, and so many connections, you know, on a global scale, that it was no problem for them to take out this London crime boss. Yeah, interesting. Uh, tell yeah. me this, I, I, we're gonna, and then we're going to go to a break, and, and we'll divide, we'll break this up into two episodes. We want to come back and talk about uh, the American La Cosa Nostra's mafia in- influence in other European and, I think, Caribbean casinos. Kind of uh, gives us a nice intro into it in terms of, like, our discussion about the Cray brothers and the casinos that they had in England that they had the American mob come over to help out with or operate. Well, the Cray brothers didn't have them come over. The, no, the, the American mob came over. Right. They were over there. So I, I want one last uh, insight into England, and then we'll go to break, and we'll come back and talk about other European casinos and American mob's influence over there. And that would be like in London. This is kind of a uh, – uh, there's no stupid questions, as they say. Uh, in, like in England or in London, was there any kind of a local Sicilian-based La Cosa Nostra family or somebody who had immigrated, say, the turn of the century and uh, early 1900s from Sicily uh, to England and rose up to to have some kind of a small crime family? I think there was. I, I have to say I haven't really uh, did any research on, on those. I couldn't find anything as fast as I uh, was looking. But I, I do know that, um, you know, that there are several uh, Sicilian uh, gangsters who Migrated, emigrated to uh, London or to the UK, and eventually set up base there. But it was more of a, a connected to their home country, so they would smuggle drugs or smuggle drugs into the UK, that kind of stuff. It wasn't like in uh, the US where you actually had a stable crime family with its origins in Sicily or in, in Naples, and then starting over in, in uh, England. That 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 hasn't happened, but they have. You know, in Europe, Europe is a small place because um, people can drive anywhere. It's sort of like the U.S. in a way, and so you have a lot of these gangsters that would go to other countries without necessarily, uh, you know, growing root as they would in New York City when they came over. So you, you would have crime families there, maybe, but not in in the way that you that you had them in in the United States. It was all just. Uh, a bunch of guys, and it, it never really, um, it never really grew into uh, La Cosa Nostra in like they have in the U.S. Yeah, so, it, so- it sounds like they, uh, if they were up in England or anywhere else in Europe, and they were out of Sicily, they probably re- remained part of a Sicilian family or a yeah. Camorra family yeah. down there. So yeah. interesting. Yeah. All right, well, let's. Uh, we're going to go to break now and and uh, come back uh, uh, next time with a. Uh, Second episode of this interesting talk with our good friend from Europe, uh, David Amoruso, who has uh, his own mob blog, and it's a really interesting one. Uh, if you think of it right now, folks, you're sitting there and you're listening on your phone, flip over to your Safari, your uh, Chrome, Chrome browser. browser, and go to www.gangstersinc.org. That's www.gangstersinc.org. It's filled with uh, great articles by David, and you'll you'll even find one by me on there. I wrote about uh, the formation of the American uh, secret police, shall we say, in in the United States, and it was formed to fight uh, these 
traveling uh, national nationally connected criminals like uh, La Cosa Nostra. We we uh, we shared information with each other police departments across the United States. It's called LEIU. Aaron, what do you uh, you got any other questions here? Quick questions before we. Head I was out? just going to ask. I mean, David had been doing this since two thousand one. If you go to the site and you, uh, is there material that? I mean, you can subscribe and get on a mail list, I imagine. But the uh, how far back can you go through the archive if you're interested in just reading? You can go all the way back. You can. Uh, I, I try to uh, organize everything into uh, several overview pages. You have a Yakuza section, you have a section on the Russian Mafia, and I've listed every article that I ever put on the website. It's on all these pages. So you can find pretty much any page that I ever was put out on the website on these uh, section pages. Wow, that's a lot of material. It is. It's a ton of material. So you, uh, you guys will have a, 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 an endless source of, of maybe new or, and maybe a different look at, at information you already knew, but a lot of new information, particularly about the, the Yakuza and the, the Russian mafia, i got a feeling, and, and other European influences because our good friend David is, uh, uh, is living over there in Europe and, and from uh, the Netherlands, I think you said. I'm going to make my public service announcement that I always do. If you have a friend or relative with a problem with drugs or alcohol, make your first call to First Call. Go to uh, their website, www.firstcallkc.org, or call them at 816-361-5900. What do you got to say to that, Aaron? I've got to say folks need to go to gangstersinc.org and uh, subscribe and, uh, and share that website as well with the folks that you know that love true crime. And then, of course, go to ganglandwire.com, subscribe, share, and uh, support the program by making a donation. Put a hit out on our donate button. And uh, also rent or buy the movie, the documentary that started it all, Gangland Wire, available on Amazon. And download the Kansas City Mob Tour app for $1.99. You can take your own personalized tour of notorious mob locations in and around Kansas City. And pick up the new book that Gary just released, available on Kindle, Leaving Vegas, how the FBI wiretaps ended mob domination of Las Vegas casinos. And I have a new one. You got a new book? I have a new one. It's going to be a short book. It's going to be available on Kindle or a, I'll, I'll send you a PDF file. If you subscribe to my website, I will send you a link to get a free Kindle, if you have a Kindle, or a free PDF of my new short book on surveillance methods and tactics and how I was able to use a lot of those, some personal experiences using surveillance uh, over the years. Everybody, let's say good night. Say good night, Aaron. Good night, Aaron. Good night, David. And good night. Bumper music provided by Odd Omatic. Follow them on Twitter at Odd Omatic Music. On the advice of my lawyer, I respect where you refuse to answer that question, as my truthful answer would make time to incriminate me. Yeah. We'll get started again. I'll, I'll make this into uh, uh, two episodes. Uh, when we yeah. come back, uh, you, what you want to talk about was about the American mob's foreign influence, and so we'll we'll go into that. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, that's what I thought. Well, we set it back up, introduce us, introduce David. and Yeah, we'll, we'll, and, uh, we'll kind of set it back up and go back over just a little bit about what we did uh, last time. We learned about the Cray Twins and... and uh, the Blade. Uh, the Blade and La Cosa Nostra. And, uh, uh, I thought that was my nickname. England, yeah, that is your nickname. <laughs> Aaron, Aaron was robbed one night on on his way home from... Uh, the, uh, I actually well, Starbucks. From Starbucks and... And uh, street robbery, and they didn't get very much. So the, the, the the idiot left his. He had his backpack with a computer in it, and he didn't ask to look at his backpack. Aaron says, "Well, all I've got's like a Starbucks cup and a dollar here. <laughs> Some change. <laughs> Some ch- and, and change. No folding money, even. And, and no, I had so one, I had one dollar. Oh, and like had one okay. cents. And so uh, uh, we had we did this." Seven-part interview with this guy who had been a skyjacker in the early 70s. And he, th- this was kind of a strange guy, but you can imagine, he, he parachuted out of a plane with $500,000. And uh, 
got away with it for a couple of weeks and, and, and told too many people. Spent 40 years in the penitentiary and then came out, and he is now working with another guy to write a book, and, and he did a, a podcast with us and he google searched his own name and found an episode that we had done about db cooper yeah and the copycats that included martin so uh when we we had to go to another city went down to st louis to interview him and when we got there he had this big one of those big wicked looking folding knives laying on his coffee table and i'm thinking oh boy what are we getting into here but as we get to talking, he says, oh, and he said, I have a gift for you guys. And he brought, brought out two more of these big, wicked-looking folding pocket knives in brand-new containers of those plastic uh, uh, shrink wrap shrink wrap containers and handed them to us. So, uh, But Aaron didn't have his knife that night. Yeah. <laughs> we Not nicknamed that him the blade. <laughs> I thought I, my friend Elliot Three didn't need me the blade because I make cutting comments. <laughs> yeah, you may. <laughs> <laughs> if you can't figure it out, Aaron's also a comedian. <laughs> Can you get him any gigs over there in Europe? Get him on a European tour? You know, yeah, what, you, know, you, know you know who's really, really <laughs> popular. Come over to Amsterdam. You know who's really popular, probably, if you know anything about comedy, would be Doug Stanhope. Oh, yeah. Doug Stanhope. Actually, I started, he kind of started in. Uh, Although he's from the East Coast, he started in Vegas and he moved down to to uh, Phoenix, and um, and was working at a club there called Finney Bones. I think just actually working like you know working the door or whatever. And uh, and I had been started doing comedy there in, in Phoenix as well. So we all kind of started in at about like the same time. We knew each other. I've interviewed him a few times, and uh, but never done many gigs with him. Pablo Francisco would be another one. <laughs> 